Thank you. That was really fast. Great. So we are on a run already. Five minutes late. Thanks for having me here again after last year. We had an interesting setup last year with a lot of people standing and moving around. This year looks more like hotel setup with a lot of column in the middle. So I'm here uh, this evening to close down a little bit the journey you had in this uh, one day. And uh, I'm going to present you this evening uh, something on, the, on the, I, the same level of ideas where we talked about last, last year. And it's about growing an agile organization rather than looking on which model do I have to use or adopt for scaling, OK? And we will go through a couple of points here, in particular uh, looking at why our organization coming to the question, what do we need to do next to scale? Why do they want to scale at all? How many of you are having the problem of scaling agile? Hands up. Why? Why you have that problem? What is it that you are trying to scale? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the same reaction I get when, it, when we go to customer and then tell us, well, what the hell is it that you are trying to scale? You know which answer we get? This kind of faces. And most of the time, I don't know, like delivery mode, we need to deliver more, OK. Then you scale. We need to organize different, OK. We need to have different process, maybe. So this is already an interesting point. It means the guys who are selling scale stuff did a very good job. Because everybody's buying it, and very few know why the hell you need it. And on one side, we have some people who think about scaling the delivery, having more project, having more throughput. But on the other side, very few ones who think about what the real challenge is that is probably scaling the agile culture and mindset within your organization. It works very well in a team because you have self-organization, you have face-to-face -face conversation, you have daily interaction with everybody, and the values and the principle behind Agile are growing consistently in this small environment because of the frequent interactions, because of the quick feedback loop, the very fast validation or not of what one is doing and allow the team to grow. On the other side, the next question that will come is why to scale? And most of the time, Interestingly enough, is that most of the company where we go, and I imagine also you've seen this, are still pretty much anchored in the corporate mindset. Yeah, 1900, where Taylor defined that hierarchical model with the delegation or not uh, of power was the way to go. Because the problem to solve was simple. The demand on the market was so high that whether you produce good quality stuff or not, it didn't really matter. There were enough people wanting to buy goods, and they just bought it. So the problem that corporations were trying to solve was to reduce the cost of production, to have more profit. And in that attempt, the solution they chosen to follow up was to hire low-skilled manpower to do mechanical repeatable work, coordinated by managers who were the one knowing how to do the stuff and guiding these people to that process. In this way, by reducing the cost of operations, hiring low-skilled uh, worker, they were able to increase the profit. And the competition was very fierce. Some company didn't manage to keep the margin high enough to survive and just closed down. We are in the 21st century. The problem we are trying to solve today is not anymore to produce at low cost enough to survive. The problem we are trying to solve today is to produce fast enough exactly what the client wants, which is a little bit of a different challenge to, to go through. So this concept of hierarchy, cubicle, very much individual-based process control, uh, top to bottom, the request of compliance as the only one thing that in an environment such as a corporate traditional place of work would count or would be appreciated as a way of controlling. If you follow the rule, if you finish a task in within the estimated time, then you are a good employee. If you don't, you are not. Corporate hates unpredictability. They hate uncertainty. Okay? It cannot be po it's not possible that you always come late to the project. Once I went in an organization, of which you will see some slides after, because I'm backing up a lot of the things we learned with real cases of customer and somehow success story and failure story as well. And you will find out that this company was very proud of being very good at doing waterfall. 
they say, we are so good that we have a deviation in project error which is less than 8%. So over 10 years analysis, they were able to prove that every project always finished within 8% tolerance of the original estimated scope, budget, and time. And I was like, wow, you must have found the silver bullet. Can I ever look how the heck are you working? Because this is going to save half of the world if this system really works. And they say, yeah, no problem. Just go to the program manager, and he will be able to guide you through the process. And he showed me his level of understanding. And I've seen he was getting estimates and uh, very, very detailed number from all the projects to coordinate a full release. And then I said, but can I go and talk to the project manager? Because I'm interested to see how the hell they come out for a feature development with 147 hours, 633.5. <laughs> so how do they do this estimate? And then I asked, do you use Kokomo 2 matrix? You have function point. How the hell you come out with such exact estimates? Then I went to the project manager and said, well, you know, I don't really know because I take out estimates from all these teams and every team leader is giving me estimates and then depending on their rate of success, I have my conversion factor. <laughs> and I go like, what is the conversion factor? Yeah, these guys tend to estimate very optimistically and so, you know, we kind of multiply by 1.8 to stay on the safe side, I see. And how about the good guys? Well, the good guys, we only multiply by 1.2. And I say, well, what is good then about that? Aren't they supposed to be the best one? I say, yeah, but still, you know, we want to stay on the safe side. Then I said, can I go to one of these team leaders? I say, yeah, sure. Then I go to the team leader, and it turns out that it does the same thing with every team member. So totally calculated, the overall budget estimation of one of these projects was between 8 to 12 times as much as originally estimated. And they were very proud of finishing every project with maximum 8% tolerance. Then I switched a little bit the focus of the conversation on, are you interested in delivering value or in controlling your cost? Because the old system you put in place seems to be very picky about every half an hour going somewhere. But what you are not looking at is what the impact and the effectiveness of this hour of work which goes through your organization. Isn't that a more interesting question? And they started then inspecting and looking into things and growing into an agile organization. After seven years, you will see what happens. Why companies like this end up with agile? Well, pretty much. Because people are desperate. They don't know what to try out anymore, and they end up trying Agile. And so you have some teams starting delivering value, motivating people, and so on. And then we have some Agile pilot success. Who of you didn't have a success with a pilot? Nobody. Come on. Everybody had a success. The pilot always succeed. <laughs> it's the ultimate purpose of a pilot is to succeed. And you know why it succeed? Because the people who are doing it want to, to, to succeed. And they do everything needed to make it succeed. And everyone goes, yes, that's the ultimate way of working. Take the big stamp and replicate it everywhere. Done. Fortunately, it doesn't work that way. Because at a certain point, organizations really don't have a choice. If you start doing agile, everyone wants to do it. So either you fire all the employees in the company, because they're not following the rules, or they just leave themselves, or you need, in a way or another, to start approaching a more agile way of working. If we look at the art of an agile organization, and we try to understand what makes an agile organization really an agile organization, there are a couple of things. First of all, focus on client value. This is what agile is all about, looking at your client, understanding what they want, and deliver that value. And also, another thing that we see, which makes Agile Team successful, is the concept of autonomy, synergy, and self-organization. This is very important and is most likely one of the causes of success in many organizations who adopt Agile. Not becoming Agile, adopt Agile. And you know why? Because for the first time in their history, probably, they are experiencing what a team means. In many organizations, we have the concept of team, but actually, if you look at those teams, it's nothing more than a group of people who namely work together toward the common goal, but each of them has their own to-do list. They barely share commitment. They are not a real agile team. 
where you look at an Agile team, because they work with the pool system, they are fully responsible of delivering the value, and it doesn't matter who does what, nobody cares. Either the team succeed or the teams fail. There is no individual success anymore. And this is what terrifies a lot of people who work 25 years to reach a certain status inside a company, and all of a sudden, a new young guys come and say, let's do this Agile thing. And the first fear they have is, what will be of me? I worked 25 years to build up my career and my position, and now you tell me I am a team member. Why I'm different from someone else. Another thing that makes teams successful is iterative and incremental change. And why is that? Because it's helping reducing risk. And there are many levels of risk. Business risk, are we doing the right thing? Before throwing away millions or billions of euros in a project, are we doing the right thing or not? Agile team finds that out normally faster than any other approach because they iterative and incrementally deliver something that can be inspected, tried out, and validated by a client or the closest proxy to it, okay? They also reduce the technical risk because by coming very fast to something which needs to work, otherwise it's not inspectable, they also validate technology very fast. And most likely they understand what is necessary to do in order to deliver high quality much earlier than the typical release cycle which ends with 24 months or 18 months or 12 months even of work at the end of which all the problem starts to come afloat. Because everyone did their job, we finish all our tasks in the estimated time, but nothing works. It's not our problem. It's a QA problem now. Ever heard that? Yeah? What can QA do to fix a problem? Nothing. The only thing they do, they start producing bugs. And that is with the dance, is my problem, no, it's your problem, starts. And this delays a lot the development within the organization. Then we have continuous improvement, a highly underestimated part of being agile. Many people just adopt Scrum, they do it by the book, and they complain that it doesn't work really well. They get the 10, 15% improvement just because they talk to each other every day. That's a good improvement. They visualize the work, maybe they get another 15% improvement, but that's it. They keep on doing the same type of Scrum from day one until they die. Because they don't do retrospective. After a while, they don't see the reason why they should analyze the process and improve. They are not paying us more to do better. Why should we? Right? And that's the moment where you realize the big piece which has gone missing is the culture. The understanding of what's in it for me if we work in a more efficient and effective way. Dave Snowden talked, uh, created, uh, authored this Kinevin framework. I'm sure many of you already seen this picture before. The Kinevin framework is an attempt to explain uh, I, I think fundamentally two things. First of all, when we work in different contexts, we might have to deal with different domains. Not everything is simple, not everything is And what we learn from Dave Snowden is depending on the domain in which we find ourselves at any point in time, the approach we need to have to actually be able to deliver value in that domain is radically different. When we are in the domain on the right side called order domain, we have a causality, means a relations between cause and effect, which is linear. This is the cause, this is the effect, okay? In one case is automatically evident to every well-thinking person, obvious, okay? It's like dividing out of a pile of Lego of multiple color, putting them into different ashes of the same color is kind of, unless you are daltonic, very easy, okay? And the other one requires a little bit of analysis. When we move on the other side, we are talking about unordered domains, where the causality is not evident. In particular, when we talk about complex problem, we know that there is no linear relationship between <coughs> cause and effect, and it's most of the time only detectable with insight. Means after the thing happened, you can make a sense why it happens, but until it happens, you don't know about it. Example, when you have an accident on an highway, as soon as the accident happened, everyone can understand why it happened, what caused the accident. But before the accident happens, nobody can predict it will. 
But nevertheless, what we can learn from that experience is that there are some conditions which generate some patterns of behavior, which if they reproduce themselves, the likelihood that another accident will happen is very high. So when the traffic throughput increases very much, and people drive crazy, and there is a lot of variation in changing in speed, the likelihood that queues will form and people will not have enough reaction time to break is very high. Means probably there will be an, an accident. This is why in many highways, when you have modern system, the, limit, uh, the speed limit decreases automatically to try to reduce the traffic density and reduce this likelihood, okay? That's a complex system. So what the highway does, try to reduce the likelihood of accident happening by repeating those patterns that have demonstrated are generating less accident. So they are reducing the throughput, they are reducing, they are trying to increase even in the United States in some places in city center, they have the stop and go to increase the space between cars because they drive so close to each other that even if you go 20 kilometers per hour, most of the time happens that someone bump into the one in front because they are too close. Okay? All these systems are ways in which we can cope uh, with a complex system. We first probe, make the experience, look what's happened, and respond accordingly to what we learn. It's a very empirical process. Okay? From William Schneider, which presented this diagram, rooting the four core culture within a possible within an organization, we learned that most of the organization coming from the Taylor and the 19th century are very strongly rooted on control. Means they believe success is strongly based on control. Okay? They also know that if they want to grow, they need to move toward innovation and cultivation. How many organizations are not saying we want to innovate? You know any? No? Maybe they say, yeah, one. Two, maybe, very seldom, okay? If you want to succeed today on the marketplace, you need to innovate. Whether it's on product, on processes, on way of working, you continuously need to innovate. So organization needs to move from this position down to cultivation where innovations happen, okay? There are two ways to do this. Either you stretch toward competence and then you move there, or you stretch toward collaboration and then you move there. Because what Schneider told us is that culture, which are at the opposite side of the quadrant, are incompatible with one another. So if you put people with this mindset, with people with this mindset together, ain't gonna work, okay? So because we know that, we need to be careful and aware, and also we need to be careful and aware that agile and lean principle are rooted on that side. Means on culture which are fundamentally based on people and collaboration not on system of work and rules and processes, okay? Agile is human. If you remember Taichi Onon in 1926, when he, he was trying to explain the pillar of Toyota and the, uh, the main goal of Lean, he said Lean is all about autonomation. And autonomation is a word invented which represents automation with human touch because he recognized that if humans are not involved continuously in improving the automation process, the automation remains a local optimization. It will never become the global end-to-end -end things that we all want. So we want to bring organization down there. Everyone wants to do that. There is a way that we found out by analyzing different patterns of work because transforming an organization with all these people inside is a complex challenge. Sometimes we find environment and context in which it's relatively easy to change a process. Other time, we find ourselves in situation where it's actually not possible to really simply change something and make it happen and work, okay? We need to experiment a lot. To do that, we came out with a very simple approach, which is a framework which help an organization to drive change management through that. And I very quickly, explain you what is it about. There is an initial phase when you assess your organization. If you're not able to measure where you are, you will never know if you got better or worse. You just guess it, and that's not a good way of improving. The second part is based on what we learn out of our organization, what do we need to improve? And here is where the touch of the Kinevin framework helps us. 
if we are dealing in a context which is in a complex domain, we need to make experiment. What Dave Snowden calls safe to fail experiment. Without experimenting, we will never be sure change will work. Okay? So, we need to define an experiment, but before starting it, we need to define what are the success and the failure criteria. Because you know what? Every pilot always succeeds because we don't define upfront what we are expecting out of it. And we, at the end of the day, we are going to the same people who wanted to do from the beginning, and we ask them, hey, how was it? Awesome. <laughs> we really rocked. And everyone says, yes, it's working. Actually, it's not that easy. So if you really want, from a corporate perspective or a company perspective, understand what value the, this um, agile pilot uh, brought, you need to be able to define from the beginning what are your expectations and match toward those expectations. Run a set of pilot projects, you keep on running them and do the round again until eventually you find out that you reach the point that you wanted to reach. And in that moment, you decide, OK, let's roll out the change. Why you want to run experiment before running, rolling out the change? I'm coming to that point in some of the next slide. Battery down. Hope the battery is not me screaming. You never know. Works? 13? Yes, thank you. We are agile, huh? This was a fast change. Feels like Formula One. <laughs> OK. So we are again back to discussing the size of the organization. So often we are story about the organization is too small, or this type of model or, or, or approach only works with a certain size of organization. Maybe we need, uh, maybe we need to focus on something which is not really much dependent on the size of the organization. And in fact, the proposition one size fits all, normally you say, well, in principle, yes, but in practice is not true. What I'm saying now is the contrary. Actually, in practice is never true, but in principle it is. Because if you base your scaling on principle, and on principle which are actionable, not good intention, which is a different thing, most likely, the same principle will be able to adapt and scale on different organizations. Today I brought three cases just for the sake of it. One is Babel, which probably you know is a startup based in Berlin. Today has over, 100, uh, over 250 people working in it. They started very small, they grow very fast, and they are creating mobile application and web application to learn different languages. Okay? They are present in many countries around the world. They just started last year in the US operations, and they're growing also there very fast. Another example is a couple of business unit, or better said, product development unit of Ericsson. Some of those date back to 2006, 2007, and most recently, in the past two and a half years, I've been working with Siemens Motion Control, which is the largest business unit of Siemens in the industry sector. What they do, they produce motors, drive, steering, controls, and integrated engineering system for people who are building supply chains, for OEM who are building supply chains. So every one of you, if anybody of you has an iPhone, that iPhone was built using Siemens technology. Just to give you an example, okay? The whole supply chain comes from there. So what are the principles that scales across all this organization? And as we said before, according to the Kinevin framework, these principles weren't identified top down but they just emerged out of the experience by comparing patterns of behavior which kept on repeating depending on the condition we were setting into the environment. The one of you who are familiar with system thinking know that one of the mantra of system thinking is that the system produces the behavior. Means independently of who you put to do a certain job, you will know that after a while, all the people inside the same constraint start to behave similarly. Because the people tend to stabilize on the lowest level of energy to fulfill all the constraints and the goals which are required in their position. 
So what we learned is we collected now, and these are all part of our enterprise transition framework, we have about 11 to 12 principles, which ranges from change management principle to organizational design principle. And today I'm going to present you four of those because they have very generic validity. Number one, focus on small incremental changes. Yes, we know that. But what it means? It means that exactly like an agile team delivers small changes of value to learn if the changes work or not, you should do the same when you install an organization-wide change management system. Instead, what we see most of the time is something like this. Long phase of design with big smoking head for months designing nice PowerPoint slide describing how the new organization should work. And after that, very acribically documented other three, four months, or maybe more, very well detailed documented. Then what happens? Roll out means someone sends the presentation per email, or they send you a link to a SharePoint folder, and they tell you, starting Monday, this is the process we use. Good luck with that. What ends up happening? Everyone reads and interprets those very detailed uh, file, and most of the time, there is a very hard work of the management to actually try to follow up and support the various employees at various levels to actually follow those processes. What is never planned is the fixed period. So as you might imagine, everything detailed on paper works very well. As soon as they start rolling out, a lot of issues start to emerge. And nobody ever thought about those issues. Guess what? Because they never tried it before. On paper, everything looks wonderful. But when you put it in practice, things start to emerge, which doesn't really work as one expected. And I'm talking very optimistically about a period of just three to four months. So the anti-pattern we're seeing, which is this one here described, is actually about trying to standardize the process before having stabilized it. What happens is that people are too much concerned about actually making a standard process for everybody before knowing it's working. And this is why they end up defining too early and too much into detail what needs to be done. Instead, what an agile organization should do is something similar to this. Small design, you have a blueprint of, of the overall change you want to go through. You detail just as much as is allowed with some coaching or approach from internal people, actually, to support that change. And you roll out document, roll out document, roll out document. Means the documentation follows up the real experience. You don't document before, you document after you tried, and you know it's working. Pretty cool that way. Otherwise, you end up re-editing documentation for all your life, because it's never going to work like you planned. In this way, you can parallelize change, and in sequence, within your organization, in period around 12 weeks' time, and this is a recurring pattern, works pretty well in all those organizations, you can focus on stabilizing the process first, and then go for what we call emergent standardization. Means the standard is not defined up front, is emerging out of all the probes and the experiment that you're running inside your organization. OK? So. What, how do we coordinate all this big mess of experiment running inside the organization? And how do we find out where are dependency and possible synergies? The way we do that is using a tool which is called the Agile Strategy Map. All this stuff is, by the way, Creative Commons. You can download it from our site. It's well documented enough that you can use it yourself. So I'm not trying to sell it. <laughs> we start with an initial goal. And after we have the goal, we have to identify what we call possible success factors. Okay? The possible success factors are leverages that you can use to achieve that goal. Who is going to determine what are the success factors for your organization? Well, I expect you and your leadership team will do a good job in a well-facilitated workshop to find out what could be possible success factor for your organization to improve. Once we have this possible success factor, we are going to identify and break down what we call necessary condition. So what do we need to do in order to fulfill that success factor? And because our possible and not certain or not critical success factor, as we call them, we need to make an experiment which allows us to validate that success factor as fast as possible before we try to make any change to the organization. Because the impact of the change or the risk of the failure will be too high. So in order to do that, 
with the help of various people at various levels within the organization, we consult the expert and we try to learn from them what do we need to do to actually be able to try out if this hypothesis we formulated actually holds true or not. Here is an example. This is how Siemens Motion Control, is an organization with over 6,000 people, started their transition with the strategy map in March 2014. And the goal was already set to the end of 2015. So this is the organization where we want to go. These are the seven possible success factors. And these are some initial necessary conditions. You would say, wow, 6,000 people all fit in a blanket of paper. Yes, for 10 minutes. Because as soon as we start breaking out in smaller work group and finding various consultants, every one of these little pieces here generated an additional strategy map. And so it breaks down and it propagates at all the level of the organization until it becomes to a level which is really operative. And you see people even making drawing to explain what they could try and experiment at that level. In this way, you don't only align all the people within the organization at every level on which changes might be meaningful, but you are also able to track dependency between these changing changes that you are empowering every individual down to the executive or to the operational level uh, to be able to actually own that change and suggesting experiments and trying out things to do. And the ex result of this experiment will reflect back to the strategy map because they will enable and unlock the last level. So the strategy map basically burns in every time you remove one of the necessary conditions because you fulfilled it, you move towards the success factor. And those practices are shared automatically across the organization. So the win of one person or the improvement of one team or a group of people actually reflects immediately to the rest of the organization. Just to make an example, one of the first experiments we made was to actually find out what the heck a cross-functional team would look like in such an organization. Because everyone said, yeah, the best way of reducing handover and delivering fast is to actually uh, go for cross-functional teams. So you don't have to ship work between one team and the next. Everything is solved within a single team. In theory, it's very easy. In practice, when you have 6,000 people and a technology stack where individual roles cover up to 130 people, it's very difficult to have a 130 people cross-functional team and keep it manageable. So you need to do a lot of experiment to find out what are the best possible cut or sensible cut you can make to that value stream to be able to reduce the end over to as much as possible. So what they did, they started six different teams between five to 18 people each, ranging commitment between 100% and less than 30% to see which possible composition was working to actually enable a team with the lowest amount of dependency to deliver a fully working feature. A feature normally includes hardware development, firmware development, and software development. So many teams needed to collaborate together to be able to actually make a full feature. As you can see there, four teams out of six reached the expected result, providing a very good set of constraints of what was the minimum set of rule, how to set up a team. Two teams fail. And the good thing is they failed, because if they wouldn't have failed, would have meant that we didn't stretch the constraint hard enough. If you only make experiments that succeed, you never learn anything because you don't know if you are trying hard enough. But when you come to a point that some experiments fail, and maybe you expect them to fail because they are really hard borderline, then you know, OK, we stretched the line enough. That experiment failed means we shouldn't do that. OK? You need to work on both sides. Second principle, focus on value and organize accordingly. This is less trivial than what it seems, because most of the time you find the famous matrix organization. You have a, product, a project management office somewhere, a lot of subsystem, infrastructure, and operation. And guess what? Project goes that way. So how many handover are happening between all these different blocks? And how often the people working on one project actually works on multiple projects at the same time? So how much waiting time and how much handover is happening when you have such an organization? You have poor outcome for the client, OK? They not get exactly what they want. They wait much longer, and they pay much more than what they wanted. 
Because this organization structure is optimized for utilization and not for value delivery. What this organization does is making sure everybody is 100% or more utilized. Okay? But if your goal is to deliver value faster and make your customer happy, you should start thinking the other way around, which is what an agile organization does. You identify what your value stream are, and you keep the value stream as a permanent, stable part of your organization. And what you make a variable part of your organization instead is the cross-pollination and the continuous transference of knowledge and experience between people working in different stream, but having common interest. Like, oh, I am a tester. I would like to know how other tester in other stream are doing their work. Or I would like to learn more about agile engineering practices. How are the other guys doing? But the stable structure, which reduces the handover, is in the direction of the value. This is no rocket science. It's what Lean has been saying for years, nearly 100 in the meanwhile. Okay? This organization is optimized for value delivery and time to market, not for utilization. It happens so that when you start calculating the cost of delay and the missed investment opportunity because of the lack of cash flow you are generating, you find out that actually this model is even cheaper than the previous one. Because if you have a release cycle of 12 months or more, means you are locking your investment for over 12 months with uncertainty, which is higher, that if you would take the same money and put them into a fund. You have potentially higher return on investment, but you are taking a very high risk. And what you also don't calculate is the cost of delay. How much market share are you going to lose because you are coming too late to the market with a product which has a tons of feature, but the market was expecting 10 of them six months ago. And some of your competitor, even smaller, delivered less complete product which exactly fulfills those six features and took away already a big share of the market. How much is that going to cost you? Nobody calculates that. An example, how do we solve the problem? How do we turn the organization around from product line and projects into value streams in which teams organize themselves and deliver with the lowest amount possible of handover? By actually starting from the strategy map, identifying that one of the success factors can be consolidating already at a portfolio level to make sure that we really have a clear value statement already at the portfolio level, and we can focus teams to deliver that single value statement. And then we will bother ourselves in categorizing where these opportunities to generate value belong to and create eventually some value stream out of it, it always in an emergent way. We don't define and categorize. We just run experiment and see how things bail out and understand if there are some similarities in the way the project runs. We identify necessary condition. We need at least three projects per product area to see how it works. We need some uh, uh, comparable dimension to measure different projects. And definitely what we want to have as a success or failure criteria is to demonstrate that if we have a project or an opportunity represented at our portfolio level, and this opportunity gets ranked in terms of potential, gets analyzed, gets evaluated, gets broken down, we have a nice backlog there, and we need to know, OK, in order for this to work, what we expect is that independent of the fact that one of these opportunities gets worked in a traditional way or in a new way, we don't lose governance from a portfolio level. And we can use the same KPI to measure the progress of one opportunity against the other, independent of the fact that they are worked using Agile or not. Because if we get that, we can scale and make probe and experiment on every single opportunity without losing control. Pretty cool if it works. Because if it doesn't, and we have endless discussion about prioritizing and make oper operational decisions, because we don't know if exactly we can trust those KPI and data, then we didn't solve the problem. We just camouflage the problem with different tools. So, what happens then to validate is that we need to take a development team pulling one of this opportunity, working in whatever way they want, and making sure that what they deliver fulfills the expected result. And to run that experiment successfully, you will have to run it with more than one team, some of those working in an agile way and some not. Because through that experimentation, you will learn what additional information you need to put on 
this project description to make it work, which criteria of done do you need to add to make sure that independent of the way of working, everyone's delivered the same expected measurable quality, okay? How we do that? Normally we found the usage of lean canvas to be a very good idea, and there is a specific type of lean canvas which we call opportunity canvas, which exactly helps you highlighting why the hell are we doing what we are doing, which customer segment are affected by it, and all the other stuff. This is the starting point. Is one of those changes in the system which produces one of those behavior that we like. Guess what happened as soon as people start using this? This one is from Siemens. Looks similar, but not quite. There's a lot more of field, a lot more of operational things, and information down here. This one is from a smaller company, Babel. They reduced the number of fields because they didn't need all those decisions to be made. They are much more lightweight and they can make decisions faster. What does this one pager contain? All the information necessary to decide if you want to do the project or not. And is supportive with the sequence of the number, the decision making process, which is modeled at the portfolio level. In this way, you can visualize this thing in a nice portfolio like that. This is Babel. On this side, you see all the next prioritized opportunities or projects. These are the four prioritized top one and are broken down into epics. As soon as there is not enough work to feed all the eight teams which are working on the other side, they pull in another one. And there is always one yellow, one blue, one green, and one red. And if you look here, all the story mingle together. And you can recognize dependency by looking at the color of the pin. So every team pulls what they think they can do, and they exactly know to which project belongs, and they know if in the same sprint they need to coordinate with the other team because they also have red pins. And because we are working on the same epic, on the same link canvas at the same time, very likely they are working on similar things. So emergently we decide to coordinate with each other in that sprint because they have the same color of pin. Very easy in this case. We have eight teams. We're talking about 70, 80 people probably. is relatively easy to do. How about this one? Here we have 130 teams. And we have 30 meter long portfolio board and another 35 meter long operational board. We are visualized in this nice piece of paper, A4, probably about 140 billion euro of projects on paper. And they go there, which tool do you use? That one. How safe is that? Well, it's very safe because every one of this document is an Excel, which is versioned and is stored in SharePoint, and uh, is controlled by the owner of that specific opportunity. Is it a pool system? Yes. There is the owner who defines an opportunity. These are the four market areas which have been represented. You see the different colors of the, of the canvas. And you see that the canvas unfold and become bigger and bigger as soon as they get filled. So the canvas start very small because they're folded. Only those fields are necessary to make the next decision. And then they get bigger and bigger. In this way, even if the board is rectangular, they are actually simulating with the space a funnel. Because the items at the beginning are smaller, and then they get bigger. So in the same space, less fit. So you have to make our decision because that column is limited. You can put maximum three in parallel and eight in a row. So you need to decide which eight you want to put there. And the way they do it is rather complicated, and I'm not going to explain you now. But they found a way that is visually possible through a couple of workshops to simply see two radar charts. One is green and one is red. The green represents the value. The red represents the risk. So when the opportunity are ranked by risk and value in one column, you can just stand back two meter and you immediately see how much green and how much red there is on each of those, and you reorder them accordingly. Is that a backlog prioritization? No, because opportunity never stops. They continuously come in. So it's more or less a kind of replenishment queue of a Kanban system. There is never a point in which you prioritize because two minutes later there is a new opportunity coming in. So you keep on shoveling around and reprioritizing by value an opportunity, whatever needs to happen. Big cultural shift, switching from 24 months upfront planning and budgeting to continuous planning and budgeting. 
and the work of the project manager and the product manager and the portfolio manager got a lot easier because they don't have to do three months of fight to pass their project, and if it doesn't pass, they wait for two years. But they actually take it much easier now because continuously, every week, there are meetings to evaluate which opportunity to promote to the next stage. And they are deciding themselves to actually drop them if they're not good enough. Third principle, decentralize whenever possible. This is also not very intuitive, or it can be. Normally, we have this problem with our hierarchical organization. The worker down there, or the subordinate, tries to reach the position of control, and this is an error in the system. You can't do that. What you need to do is the following. So what ends up happening is that we introduce delay into the system, because between the moment of the request happen and the authorization gets forwarded, people are waiting. Or they are taking the risk. Some people like to ask for forgiveness instead of permission. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. This organization hierarchy is based on distrust. It's coming from 1884, I believe, where the West Trail Corporation, which was scaling, the first uh, enterprise in the world, actually needed to scale. And they evaluated two different models for scaling. One was the Catholic Church, self-organizing small unit with a common intent and direction. And the second one was the army. Guess what they choose? The army. And the army hierarchy was based in 1884 to make sure that the people who are at the bottom know as few as possible about your intention and strategy. Because if they get captured from the enemy, they are not able to deliver any valuable information. That's the enterprise. Cool, huh? It works very well when you are working with manual workers which are doing only mechanical repeatable work. It starts to crack apart when you work with knowledge workers who studied for years and they are eager to use their brain. But if you don't feed their brain with information and you hold those information back, those brains are going to switch off and not to deliver the value you expect. If you want the brain to switch on again, you better use the approach which most agile organizations use, which is empowerment of the worker. But empowerment is not just a nice word. It's about talking with the management and understanding in which container, which people are allowed to do what. Because then you reduce the amount of escalation and decision which needs to go up to the upper level. There is no hierarchy. There are boxes and people belonging to these boxes with different level of empowerment. This approach and this model foster collaboration within a container and also across multiple containers. This is an emergent pattern that has been verified multiple times. Simple example, when you have multiple teams which are self-organizing, SOS happen. You know SOS, emergency, is scrum of scrum. It's an emergent solution. People decide to talk to each other because they are stepping on each other's feet and because they know and trust the level of empowerment they have and they know that the other team is exactly in the same situation. So they can talk to each other and change things because the people to whom they talk can make decisions. There would be no point in having a scrum of scrum if there is still a hierarchical decision model in place because the people meeting to solve the problem most likely won't be able to solve it. And then it doesn't work. And then you read a lot of articles on the internet, but Scrum or Scrum doesn't work. Yeah, of course it doesn't. If you do it in the wrong way, it never works. Decentralized control reduces overhead and facilitates collaboration. This design is based on trust. Trust is not easy to gain. and needs to be gained through incremental experiment, through incremental delegation. Leadership needs to practice situational leadership and servant leadership. Learn and teach the other people they want to delegate how to do the job, waiting until they learn and they feel comfortable enough to overtake the responsibility and finally delegate. If that happens, you have success. On a team level, which is a container, here there are the policy described of what the team can decide and what the team cannot decide. Okay? It's very clear. They take a full opportunity, they take the budget of that opportunity in their end, and it's the responsibility of the product owner of this team to manage that budget. And this means you have 40 weeks, team weeks of work to complete this opportunity. 
you can use them however you want, which means that product owner can decide to go to another team and buy some of their sprint until they fit within the 40 weeks of budget and is still able to report on a weekly basis on what is the status of progress on the agreed target scope that he needs to deliver. And every week he updates his burn-up chart and goes to the portfolio management and said, OK, I consume 20 weeks. I still have about 20% of the scope to complete. I'm confident I'm going to finish it. And as soon as he's not confident anymore, and you can see it rather early, because we use empirical control, means you count how many stories are done and how many are left. It's not just an estimate. OK. And based on that, you can simply count, well, in three, four sprints, maybe we're going to finish. And when you see the budget is not enough anymore, or you need to reduce the scope, then you go back to the portfolio and have that conversation. But only in that moment. So you are not overloading the poor portfolio manager with daily work about deciding, should I do this story or not? Or should I use this week or not? The same thing in Siemens. This is a bit of a larger project. Here you see all the policies they have written as well to understand who can do what in which constraint. The first principle, the fourth one, is avoiding synchronization of flow unless strictly necessary. This is also very unintuitive because, as you know, most of the model we are used to, they try to synchronize all the project with many project managers for a big bang release. Everyone should release at the same time. Sounds a good idea. It's like everyone goes at the station because the train starts. I heard that analogy already. So you have three project managers. A project starts, then all of a sudden, the management decides, oh, let's do the other project. Then you move resources away. I call them resources intentionally in this case. And you see that one project starts to slow down because people are cut between two different projects. Then another one starts. And because the second project we started is delayed already, then what we do, oh, we move people away from the last one we started because the second one is delayed as well. And what happened, most likely the first one will be delayed as well. There's a lot of effort here and a lot of communication going on and coordination between the project manager because they all need to release at the same time, which introduces a lot of other dysfunction that you are familiar with. The risk of integrating all new code at once is very high. The likelihood to find a bug when you change 2,000 lines of code at the same time, good luck with that. Even if you use continuous integration, but people worked in parallel stream until three days ago, Still good luck with that, OK? So the way Agile team do instead, in, instead of having fixed scope and fixed date, an Agile organization, first of all, works with team. And team are a stable structure. It's not something you can pull out people from and move them to another side. And then you release continuously. One, two, three, four, five releases. Whenever a feature is done, reintegrate and release. There are organizations which really excel at doing this. And in this case, we have variable scope and variable date, which is not the bad news, because it means you can decide whenever you want to release whatever you want to release. It is not a bad place to be. One of the examples, so one of the first organizations in which we installed the enterprise transition framework, there is a summary slide next, uh, is Ericsson Mobile Core, which is today probably one of the most profitable product development units in Ericsson. We started there in 2006 with some leadership work. We started a big transition around 2008, which finished in end 2010. And we kicked off a whole bunch of internal coaches, 21 people, who went to eight different locations around the world and started replicating this pattern. Okay? At the time, Ericsson was able to deliver a project between 18 to 24 months, a new release of their complete mobile soft switch. Today, they basically can release whenever they want. And they are so clever that they also might change now the business model and think about providing full network to, uh, as a lease the service to telecom operators. And so they control the upgrades themselves. They can update to the latest version of software without incurring a very high cost of upgrade to telecom operators. They can even decide to sell at a premium price new feature to operators who want to pay more money to have the exclusivity for it for a couple of months. So they won't release the feature which is already ready to the others. Okay? You can do a lot of things. If you start working agile, you can think about a lot of business models, idea, which can come out just because you can. You don't have to, but you can. Okay? This is an example of another Ericsson PDU. This is the uh, Allied Network. They do backbone network transport, okay? Fiber optic stuff, one terabit per second. Very nice. This is a test environment. There are various species of the hardware. The final product will fit in a 19 inches rack and is about 
65 centimeter high, this is the test product. So it's like two square meter. Okay, it needs to be minimized. But by doing iterative and incremental development of hardware, software, and firmware, they are already capable in early phases, just two months, to have a serviceable product. Means is transporting bit as it should. It doesn't have yet all the super duper features that the telecom wants, but after two months only, they are already able to test and prove that actually does what it should do. And obviously the form factor is not yet there. It will be refined and improved over time, but this cross-functional team is continuously integrating and trying to increase the quality and also removing the waste because they see it. They see where is the waste, they see where performance lack, they remove pieces, they try adaptation, and every two weeks they meet again with little changes, maybe a change here, maybe a change there, a little bit in the bootstrap software and so on, and validate those changes again. What Bubble does, continuous delivery, every feature in Bubble is available on all platforms at the same time, and they release every single feature independently. They are not taking 20 features and waiting six months to make a big bang release, but they release every single feature independently. The only impediment now is that both Google Store and Apple Store are actually having a time for evaluation which delays the time at which the feature will actually be available on mobile devices. Otherwise, they would exactly all at the same time be released. Siemens Motion Control, another big organization here, they are building hardware and software for supply chain. This is a PLC unit. It's a runtime unit which connects to a lot of electric motors around the supply chain and coordinate their movement, synchronize the power, and implement safety feature. Means if something happens to that engine because an operator does something wrong or there is an overload, this central unit is able to block and take the corrective action without breaking anything and possibly also saving human life. This is a statement from the project manager of that uh, organization which also won an uh, innovation award. This is most significant changes after seven years of transition in Ericsson Mobile Core. You see the awareness is very high because most of these things are about culture. Commitment. We have moved from the question, are you committed to how can we deliver? It's not anymore, you should do that with the nice commitment word, but how can we do that together? Okay? Distribution instead of hierarchy. Planning forecasting is distributed. Many people do this continuously at various levels. Each party trusts the other one doing it, and continuous flow of planning, follow-up, and adaptation. Okay? Collaboration instead of coexistence. They stop doing internal building when it's not needed. That's a funny thing, right? Oh, I tell you my mandates. And then you play with monopoly money in the end. This one is Siemens. This is a PLC unit beyond the 19th generation. These are the learning out of the project. Gunther Birk is the project manager or chief product owner who ran this project with seven teams. About 40 people were actually more because we involved two other teams doing the work. And these are his takeaway. Okay? To make your appetite, they measure that actually the delivery speed, the lead time of hardware development went down 40%. They had a better quality and they had an enhanced design for production, which wouldn't have been possible following traditional product development approach for the first time. Okay? And this is the way they did by parallelizing some activity with cross functional team 40% speed less, 25% less budget. This is the MTS award they won in 2014 for being able to actually innovate and deliver within a time which was incredible because it's 18 months from conception to delivery. The traditional time to do something like that is between five to three years, if you are good, okay? So takeaways and then I'm done. There is no blueprint for an agile organization. You need to learn to grow agile within your organization, okay? There is not agile you can buy. There is no model which suits them all. Because to tell you the truth, how many times you go to your organization or you look to another one and you say, yes, but we are different. We are more complex. How many times you have that? All the time. So how can it work that everybody runs after the same scale model? If everyone is different, how can it be that all of a sudden everyone will be the same again? It doesn't really fit together. Probably because people don't have a better alternative. Because this alternative requires more
your work. You have to fill up your sleeve and start taking your own risk and owning the change yourself. Scaling is not about delivery model and is not about is more about cultural change and continuous improvement. Okay? Agile is not doing sprint, having a backlog and having a scrum master running around saying where are my post-its, but it's more about changing the culture toward continuous improvement. Okay? Becoming agile for an organization is not a goal. Many people said we want to become agile, and you should ask them why. What do you hope to find in agility? What are your business goals? Which one of those do you think will be reached earlier if we work in another way? Last but not least, experience shows, and we have tens, dozens of cases like this one, where really we can recognize the repeatable pattern, and if you are able to understand those patterns, you can actually put in place the condition to have those behaviors emerge again out of your organization. Will they look the same? Absolutely not. As you can see from the picture, every implementation of the same principle is light here away from each other. They are totally not comparable. Yes, they have a board and they have post-its on it, but this is not the way you judge comparable 